Hello and welcome to this Intelligence Squared online debate. Uh, we should all go vegan. Um, and I can say that I have been both vegan and carnivore, I would say almost, and I've also been vegetarian. I've tried the whole lot, I'm pescatarian, um, but I am very open to debate um, and to my mind being changed. So first of all, I'm gonna ask you to make your first vote so we can see whether your mind's going to be changed. Um, you need to vote for or against the motion, should we all go vegan? And if you're unsure, you can vote undecided. This is going to take a couple of minutes probably for the results to come through. So before we start, I'm going to explain briefly how this session is going to work. Um, in a moment, our two debaters are going to make their opening speeches. Then I'm going to chair some debate between the two of them. And then I'm going to take your questions. So anything you think of as you go along, uh, you need to scribble down and then you can send it across. And at 6.55, the speakers are going to end the debate with short closing statements. And then I'm going to ask you all to vote again. And we're going to see whether anyone has changed their mind at all. So if you can start sending your questions to the speakers as soon as you uh, want, and you can type your question in the box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if you don't want your name mentioned, don't worry, you can just click anonymous uh, before you press send. You can also tweet using the hashtag IQ2 and... Uh, then we will see what the first vote is. And I haven't actually seen it yet. I haven't been told what it is. So we may have to start before we know what the answer is. Unless anyone else is, George, have you been given the results before me? <laughs> no, no results I was yet. sent them in the post yesterday. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I think then we should get going and I will, if the results come through, I will announce them. Um, but I think we should first, I'm going to give a brief introduction to George, who doesn't really need very much introduction. He's a Guardian columnist. He's the best-selling author whose latest book is Regenesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet, which is a fantastic read and very eloquent as well as persuasive. He's a committed vegan, um, although I think occasionally you have cracked. And you can watch his documentary, a, a it's Apocalypse Cow, How Meat Killed the Planet, which is on channels for my four. And I think actually you may have eaten a stag in that, um, mm. although it was shot entirely for environmental reasons. Not a um, whole one, I hasten to not a whole one. Well, a whole one would be quite a lot, actually, wouldn't it? Um, but I hope it wasn't a whole. Left heart. the antlers. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the antlers don't, you can actually have the antlers on toast, can't you? Can you? Yes, isn't that what Lady Glenbow did? Well, um, I came here to learn stuff, and it's already begun. <laughs> try it out one time on Exmoor, Dartmoor. Um, George is going to speak for seven minutes, so would you like to start now? Thanks, Alice. Well, yeah, the, the problem we have with this debate is that the great majority of people, I think it's fair to say, are in deep denial about where their animal products come from. And we all uh, have a picture of livestock farming um, as being the picture that was really planted in our minds by those children's books that we were all exposed to when we were pre-literate. You know, the, the, the classic children's book is a livestock farm with one rosy cheek farmer, one cow, one pig, one horse, one, one cat, one chicken. They all talk to each other. They all live in harmony. No indication of why they might be there or where they might be going. And the reality could not be further from the truth, as I found when I worked on an intensive pig farm uh, as a teenager. And every day I was thinking, first of all, this isn't what they told me farming was about. And secondly, why is this legal? You know, if we treated our cats and dogs like we treat pigs and chickens, for example, we would be sent to prison. But the great majority of our animal products come from intensive factory farms like that. Um, in countries like the UK, between about 85 and 90% of our animal products come from those places. And they are devastating for animal welfare, but also environmentally devastating. Um, and that's because they need to be fed. They can't feed themselves in those sheds. And so the food is imported, often from the other side of the world, where it can be have devastating consequences in its production. An area the size of Spain in Brazil has been destroyed to produce soy, um, to largely to feed the world's farm animals. Um, and, and then the nutrients pass through those animals. There's far too much dung for the land to absorb. And so when farmers spread it on the land, they claim they're fertilizing it. In fact, they're dumping the dung 
it washes off into the rivers and kills the rivers. And we're seeing this with the River Wye, many other rivers around the Welsh borders. Um, it, uh, dairy farms are doing similarly in um, Patrick's part of the world, in Pembrokeshire, and, and in my part of the world, in Devon as well, with just horrendous consequences. And so people say, well, the answer then, obviously, is to go for extensive livestock farming, free range livestock farming, and to eat pasture fed meat. And this has become the great call of foodies and celebrity chefs and even some environmentalists. That's the answer, because, you know, we like that picture. We like the picture of cattle and sheep grazing in the fields. It looks harmonious. It chimes with thousands of years of pastoral poetry and children's stories. Um, and you know, BBC programs, because if the BBC were any keener on sheep, it would be illegal. Um, but the reality of that is in some ways even worse than the reality of factory farming because of the vast amount of a resource that it uses that we neglect massively in environmental discussions. It's possibly the most important of all metrics, and yet we scarcely discuss it. It should be right up there with greenhouse gases, synthetic chemicals, all the rest of it. What is it? Land use. The amount of land we use is an absolutely critical environmental issue because every hectare we use for our own extractive purposes is a hectare which can't be used to support wild ecosystems such as forests and wetlands and savannas and natural grasslands not not enclosed and used for pasture and and, and those wild ecosystems are what the great majority of the world species depend on and in fact earth systems as a whole depend on the survival of wild ecosystems. Now there's one area in which we are tuned into land use and that when, that's when it comes to urban sprawl. And we all dislike urban sprawl and so we should. It's bad for cities, it's bad for the countryside. But the entire urban area of the planet occupies 1% of its land surface. All the homes, all the businesses, all the infrastructure, 1%. Much of the rest of the planet is desert, is ice caps, um, is, is mountain ranges. Um, just 15% is protected areas but by far and away, the greatest land use is farming. And, um, and farming occupies roughly 38% of the land surface of the planet. And when I say farming, you're probably thinking of growing crops, but that occupies just 12% of the land surface of the planet. And of that, almost half those crops are being grown to feed to those animals in the factory farms. So only six or 7% of the planet's surface is growing crops to feed humans directly. So what about the 26% of land, which makes up that 38%? All that is producing pasture-fed animals. It's basically pasture-fed meat production. And this carries an enormous ecological opportunity cost and an enormous carbon opportunity cost. In other words, the cost of what you're not using that land for, which is supporting wild ecosystems. And despite the outrageous climate denial claims of the livestock industry, uh, wild ecosystems are almost invariably much richer in carbon um, and, and lower in greenhouse gas emissions um, than any of the pastures being used to produce our beef or our lamb. Now, there was a study in the United States which said, what if we were to do what all the foodies and celebrity chefs are doing and switch away from eating corn fed beef, which is enough of a problem, and switch towards pasture fed beef. They found that you would have to increase the area used to produce cattle in the United States by 270 percent. You'd have to cut down all the forests, drain all the wetlands, water all the deserts, degazette the national parks, demolish the cities, and you would still be importing a lot of your beef from Brazil. There's simply not enough planet to do it. We could all eat pasture fed beef and, and lamb if we had several planets and no space for wild ecosystems on any of them. But as we don't, and as we desperately need to conserve and restore wild ecosystems, if we're going to get through this century, we just can't arrogate that right to ourselves. Um, and, and the fact is that, you know, if we were to make that switch to pasture fed beef, only the rich would eat it. You know, there's this idea, well, we can all eat less and better, but that, you know, does that ever work with any luxury product? You know, do, do, do the world's poor eat beluga caviar once a year um, or bluefin tuna sushi once a year? No, because that's not how luxury products are distributed. 
if we produced far less meat, which we ought to, only the very rich would eat it. There is no good way of providing animal products, which everyone can meet, eat without inflicting enormous damage to earth systems. And so we, we, we live in this state of delusion, really, that, that we can somehow have a thriving planet and at the same time um, eat exactly what we want to eat. But actually our diets are by far and away the biggest impact of all the things we do. And by far the biggest component of that impact is eating livestock products. In fact, if we, if we stopped eating livestock products, according to a paper in Science, uh, we would save 76% of the agricultural land area that we currently use. And if we did that, then that would enable a great global rewilding. We could restore ecosystems on a massive scale. We could bring back the rainforest. We could bring back the wetlands. We could bring back the wild savannas and the wild grasslands at sea. We could bring back the, the, the kelp forest, the coral reefs, the ocean, um, uh, the ocean sea floor, which uh, is absolutely essential to protecting life and protecting carbon. And all that would be possible if we switched away from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet. And I don't think this is a luxury. In fact, it's quite hard to see how we're going to avoid the sixth great extinction, and for that matter, the collapse of Earth systems, unless we switch away from eating animals. There are two fundamental things that we have to do to prevent the environmental disaster that scientists predict if we don't change course. One is to leave fossil fuels in the ground. The other is to stop eating animals. Thank you. Fantastic. Now, I have to say the results are in. So you've got quite an uphill battle, I feel, George, but it was very uh, well argued. So we'll Welcome see. Welcome to my life. Changes, but 8% agree and 48% disagree um, with 44% undecided. So I think we're now over to Patrick. Um, who may have an easier job, but on the other hand, if you lose some voters, um, it may be awkward. So uh, we will uh, talk uh, now to you. And you are the founder and chief executive of the Sustainable Food Trust and patron of the UK Biodynamic Association. And um, I think really since I first became interested in farming, you have been a major player on the scene and very involved. I think the first time I met you was bread making actually. So you've been involved in the whole process for, for generations really. Um, your work centers on the importance of transforming our food and farming systems to address climate change and to reverse the biodiversity loss and improve public health. Uh, you're also an organic farmer in Wales uh, and you've got a herd of 80 Ayrshire cows. Um, so George may not be thrilled by that, um, but your milk goes to produce cheese and um, you are feeding um, people not with a vegan diet but with a much more healthy diet that they might get if they just popped down to McDonald's. Um, so you now have seven minutes to speak. Well thank you very much. Um, thank you George and I just would like to start by acknowledging your great work George. I think you are an incredible environmentalist and campaigner. I've admired you for many years and I think your book Regenerasis uh, the first half of which I fully agree with, is a brilliant critique of what is wrong uh, with industrial farming, including livestock. So there is so much we share. And for me, it's very disappointing uh, that there's such a polarization of, of our views over the role of livestock in sustainable farming systems, because I agree with you that the livestock systems that predominate all over the world at the moment are definitely part of the problem. But rather than trade statistics with you, which we could do, and no doubt we will do uh, when I've had my six minutes and, and there's a bit of a, you know, back and forward, um, I want to talk about my own practical experience. And because I think that uh, one of the reasons why I think you doubt the capacity uh, of farming to transport in a way which will uh, have livestock really at the centre of the sustainable food systems which replace the ones that we've got at the moment is because you're not a practitioner. I am a practitioner. Um, I'm within a month of celebrating our 50th anniversary here on this 300 acre 
mainly livestock farm. You know that we've grown vegetables along the road and we were just talking about it. We used to be a carrot producer for supermarkets. We had to stop because the system um, got too centralized. And I've just been out today ridging up my potatoes. So I'm a, 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 a definitely a, a vegetable grower, but the main use of the land on this farm uh, is for producing uh, livestock. We have now a 90 cow Ayrshire herd and followers and uh, we produce cheese, as Alice just said. And um, what is really interesting about our farm, after 50 years of not using any nitrogen fertilizer and farming in harmony with nature, is the impacts. The first of which I want to focus on a little bit, which is carbon. We just had a carbon audit, and it looks as though, if you believe the data, that we are actually carbon negative. In other words, the soil building of in the permanent pasture and the rotations because we do grow some oats and peas to feed our cows um, looks as if it not only offsets the methane emission of the cows but also the energy that we use on the farm so we are net carbon negative now obviously this is just one farm and i i also want to speak about the nature impacts uh, you said that if we took more land out of uh, production to um if we if we carried on um if we went to my system at scale uh, it would have devastating impacts because we'd have to have more land in production. Well, the, if you farm in harmony with nature, you have fantastic biodiversity outcomes. Our farm is alive with birds, small mammals, insects, amphibians, all because we're not farming in a hostile way and the, life, the wildlife can coexist with the system. We also employ around seven full-time equivalent labor units on the farm. And so if you take it together, um, we are producing a lot of food. We're producing enough cheese to feed 3,000 people. Uh, the milk we sell uh, could feed another 2,500. And the meat, which comes either from the dairy cows at the end of their lives or the male calves, can feed another 500. Now, you might say this is just one farm. And what did you say? You said, we're living in a state of delusion. Well, I, I plead guilty. I am in the state of delusion. After 50 years, I'm convinced that my farming system could go to scale. And if you don't believe me, we did a report which we published uh, just recently called Feeding Britain from the Ground Up, where we modeled a nationwide transition of farming to sustainable farming systems operating within planetary boundaries, the sort of farming I'm doing here. And we looked at the impact on total food output. And the fascinating conclusions are that we could maintain and maybe even slightly increase our national level of food security and our staple foods if we switched to farming systems like the one we are using here. And if we scale that globally, yes, we could feed the world, but only if we ate differently. Here's some areas where we agree. We give up all industrial livestock farming. Uh, no more cheap chicken, no more horrible pork from industrial pork units or mega dairies. You mentioned there are mega dairies near this farm in Keridigian. But if we, if we gave up eating meat, it would be a problem because the farms that need to, the farming systems that need to replace the ones we've got at the moment would rely on a rotation, 50% of which at any one time would be in fertility building. And that would normally be clover and grass. And to maximize the food output from uh, that system, and actually, I would say to revitalize the soil, we need livestock, grazing livestock, yes, mainly grass fed, not exclusively grass fed in a dairy system, but certainly with beef and lamb production, more or less 100% grass fed. And if we did that, we'd actually have quite a lot of meat to eat, far more than most people think. What we have to give up is the cheap chicken that everybody's become used to. So in summary, I'm not sure how, how I'm doing for time, but in summary, if that system was scaled globally, every country would have a different diet because obviously the geography, soils and climate of different countries varies, but there's no reason why we couldn't maintain our livestock production, except that we change what we eat and take that to scale. So I think that you need to come here, George, you remember you may have remember you were here in 2007 at the launch of Transition Town Lampeter, but you didn't have a chance to look around. But uh, in celebration of our 50th anniversary, come and look for yourself, because I think at this time, it's important 
that environmentalists, environmentalists work together, sync our differences and share our stories. And my story is that it is possible to produce livestock working in harmony with nature. My wife, uh, Becky, is out there milking the cows at the moment. She sings to them when, when, when she's milking. They are loved. Uh, they are treated with compassion throughout their whole lives. And the cheese and the milk that we produce and the meat is a reflection of our compassion for the animals. There's no reason why we can't take that to scale. Thank you, George. Now, if there are any more questions, they're coming in now, but we, we can take quite a few more. Um, I'm gonna start. I'm very interested, Patrick, today you're on the Today programme, but and you weren't invited to number 10, but you really should have been, shouldn't you, by Rishi Sunak for the farming conference today. Do you think, uh, listening to what came out of that, that the government has any interest at all in your kind of farming and being more sustainable? Or do you think in the end we're more worried about trade wars and about trying to be profitable? I think, well, I think trade wars are important because we need to have a way of measuring the sustainable impact of all the different foods that we're trading in, because trade will continue because we are structurally unable to be self-sufficient. But I don't think that the sort of issues that I was talking about on the Today programme this morning will have featured in the conversation when we, when I listened to Judith Batchelor and Minette Batters uh, later on in the programme, I was thoroughly depressed and it was rather annoying that the presenters didn't bring up the points that I'd made because it seems to me that we need an agricultural transition just like we've had or are having an energy transition and it will have many of the same features because at the moment if you farm in a sustainable way as we do you make less money and are less profitable than if you're farming in an extractive way and I'm sure George and I would agree with that so what we need is a mechanism like the feed-in tariffs to enable the transition to truly sustainable farming systems, which do involve, would, would involve rotations uh, to build fertility. And I think that's the key point that we need to drill down on, because I don't think, Tolly um, is a great hero in uh, George's book, Regenesis. I've known Tolly for 40 years. He's a vegan grower. He said to me very recently, quote, you know I agree with you about the role of livestock in extensive farming systems. Definitely you can produce vegetables um, in a vegan system. Tolly does it and my friend Peter Seger down the road does it. But if you want to farm at scale, you need a crop rotation and to turn that crop rotation into food that we can eat, uh, we need grazing livestock. So George, what is wrong with um, Patrick's assessment that if you had lots of small farms that were carbon negative and um, that yeah. were produced at scale, um, why we couldn't accept that and have that? And wouldn't that actually be a better way mm -hmm. of producing a sustainable environment and sustainable farming? Well, I don't want to diss um, what Patrick does at all. You know, he's, he's, he's totally sincere and, you know, he's a lovely guy and um, he treats his cows very well and all the rest of it. But I just don't buy it. If he is indeed a carbon negative livestock farm, he's the first one on earth because there's been endless studies published in peer reviewed journals looking at the claims of being carbon negative and none of them so far have withstood the scientific pro process. In fact, there was um, a, a meta study published um, at the Oxford Martin School, part of Oxford University called Grazed and Confused, um, looked at 300 papers and it found no instance anywhere on earth of livestock farmers even washing their own faces in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, let alone drawing down extra carbon emissions. And there's a fantastic amount, I'm not in, in any way saying that this is what Patrick's doing, because, but you know, there is a huge amount of jiggery pokery involved in, in carbon calculations of what's going on under the soil. And it's just far too easy to make things look right when they really aren't. As for the idea of, well, we could produce more pasture-fed meat, I mean, already 51% of the UK is, is, is producing pasture-fed meat, and yet it produces scarcely any. I did calculations for, for, for sheep, for, for mutton and lamb, and estimated that 4 million hectares of the uplands are being used to produce mutton and lamb in this country, and yet it produces just 1% of our diet. Now, 4 million hectares is the same amount of, as all the grain growing. In, in, in the UK, which produces a very substantial part of our diet. It's a really profligate form of land use. It's agricultural sprawl is what we're looking at. And this has an enormous opportunity cost. So if you look at the hills of Britain, 
they are almost entirely bare. There's scarcely any trees above 200 metres. Parts of inner London have more trees per hectare than those hills have, including in our national parks. And people think that's natural. It's not. The altitudinal tree line in the UK is, is well over a thousand metres ev everywhere except perhaps the top of the Cairngorms and one or two other very rocky parts of the highlands. Almost everywhere else there would be trees. In the western half of Britain it would be dominated by temperate rainforests. The reason there are no trees is primarily because sheep and cattle selectively browse out tree seedlings. They're extremely nutritious. They're the things they like to eat more than anything else. And so unless you bring your numbers down to ridiculously low levels, one sheep per 20 hectares, no trees are going to grow. And that is the most basic component of ecological re uh, regeneration, trees returning to a formerly forested landscape. If you haven't got trees returning, it's not regeneration, it's not regenerative. Um, and so you get all these terms banded around. This is regenerative farming. You know, it's just like the word sustainable. It gets just tacked on to anything you happen to be doing. Regenerative ranching, formerly known as ranching. Um, it's just, just a word which people use. And when you look at the actual wildlife, which uh, farms, even wonderful, beautiful picture book farms like Patrick's support, it's a very thin selection of the wildlife that could otherwise be living there, starting with the large predators. You know, we don't have wolves and lynx in this country because livestock farmers insist that they don't get reintroduced, having wiped them out because they um, um, uh, compete with us for, for food, which is because they might eat some of the livestock. And everywhere you go on earth, with only one or two very small exceptions, um, large predators are driven um, to extinction or to the brink of extinction at the behest of livestock farmers. You don't have the trees growing on these farms. Uh, there was a, another meta-analysis looking at 100 papers um, uh, and found out that uh, for all major ecological groups, guilds of, of, of wildlife, um, every single one suffers from having livestock on the land except for detritivores, animals which eat dung. All the other groups suffer. They all improve when you take the livestock off the land. So this idea that you can square the circle you know, we can have our beautiful picture of the cattle and the sheep grazing on the land, and you can have thriving ecosystems. It exists in picture books. It exists in, in our image of farming. But actually what the numbers show is something very different. And, and you know, Patrick, he paints a beautiful picture, but the problem is we are dealing in pictures when we desperately need to be dealing in numbers. We need to become food numerate. And just as with climate issues, you know, we've slowly become climate numerate. We've begun to do the maths. We've begun to understand how much fossil fuels we need to leave in the ground if we were to avoid a certain amount of global heating. The same has to happen with food. Otherwise, we're cooked. Well, so, Patrick, the... someone has asked, they've said, actually, this is, I mean, definitely reply in a minute, but they've asked whether when you scale up your system, um, would people be able to eat the same amount of meat? Are you expecting to, them to have the same sort of diet? Or if you had your farms rolled out across the countryside, would they be eating a predominantly vegetable-based diet with some of your cheese and uh, sustainable uh, meat? Well, in the, I mean, the answer is all in our report, Feeding Britain from the Ground Up. I would recommend people should download it from our website. Um, and there's a lot of data in there, and it's all very carefully researched. And if I'm unable to trade statistics with George now, uh, I've got colleagues, Robert Barber, Richard Young, back at base camp, who will do that because we care as much as George does about getting the data right. So George raised a lot of issues. Um, evidence of soil carbon outcomes, that's important, very important. The French minister, Stephen Le Foll, at the COP21 set a target of four per thousand catch per meal. Uh, it was a challenge for all the countries of the world to use farming systems which built their soil carbon by 0.4% per year. Now, I'm sure George doubts uh, the veracity of our recent audit, and that's fair enough, George, but uh, there's a growing body of evidence that shows that if you adopt holistic grazing practices, as we have been doing here for the last five years, you get re a continuous soil carbon gain. And the most surprising thing about our recent audit was, because we've been keeping soil carbon records for now over 10 years, is that some of the permanent pastures 
which have been now rotationally grazed with a mob grazing system, are showing the highest soil carbon gain. Now, obviously, one swallow doesn't make a summer, and that's a, so it's a very important thing to test. But there is a, a website called Carbon Cowboys, run by a man called Peter Bick, who's a researcher at the University of Arizona, Ar State, Arizona State University, who's been doing some really amazing work on comparing holistic grazing farms with their neighbors. And it looks as though those farms could achieve the four per thousand target as set by at the COP21. I think we may be getting close to it here. So it's really important that we, uh, we do more research in this area. There's a growing body of research suggesting that you can build soil carbon really quite quickly. And if we're right, then that's huge. And I'm sure, George, you would agree that if this evidence can be presented to you and you thought it was valid, you would have to change your opinion about livestock. Well, that's always the case with, with everything. If, if I see the evidence, I will change my opinion. You know, I'm entirely evidence led on this issue, which is why I turned from being an advocate of meat eating to a vegan. And well, on, that, on can I just say, carbon, George, that's mm, fantastic because mm, it, I, I think this is the beginning of a conversation between us where we really do need to look hard mm. at the data. And by the way, I hope you'll know a chap called Pete Smith, who's a grassland scientist at the University of Aberdeen. And he's more with you and, than with me about the potential of grassland to build soil carbon. But I said to him when I recently saw him, you know, absence of evidence isn't necessarily evidence mm. of absence. Sure. And the truth is the grassland science community have not been doing proper studies on this. Yeah. But we don't have an absence of evidence on this. Um, in fact, um, it's it's really very clear. You're quite right that some forms of ranching will sequester more carbon than other forms of ranching, but not by comparison to the natural ecosystems that would have been there before. That, no. You know, you can offset. Let me finish this. So, so you can say, OK, in this field where there are X number of cows grazed in a particular way, there's more carbon than in this field where there are Y number of cows grazed in a different way. Yeah. That's totally uh, uh, fine, and and we can we can agree on that. But what what the the climate change committee, the government statutory climate change committee shows, is that if you go from pasture to woodland, which is what what much of the land we're talking about would have supported, you increase your carbon by twenty five tons per hectare. That's just your below ground carbon, let alone the carbon in the trees above ground. And this is massively greater than any of the sort of details of this, this grazing system versus that grazing system. I don't think that's so, true, actually, so, George. I and, just and, want to say, I don't think that's true. What, you don't I think, think that what the CCC is, a, is saying is, is true? A, no, I don't. And by the no. way, Lord Deben, who's the chair of the Climate Change mm. Committee, privately agrees with me. Yeah, you see, you're giving all this a private anecdote. You know, someone said to me this, someone said, you know, the, the published figures patrick are, are, are you know th that they had you we have to meet certain scientific standards i know that if we're to, to George, this, i'm just going to move on but i think that we've also got on your side you really need to um explain what your what you want instead so someone's put mm. what are the true costs of producing healthy vegan based products and mm. the new scientist this week suggested that lab grown meat could be 25 times worse for the climate yeah. than beef sure so, so i mean i'm, I'm not that's advocating my lab -grown issue. Meat. Yeah. yeah, so my problem was that I read your book and, and I thought the first half was extraordinary. I loved it. I thought it was Brilliant. fantastic. Brilliant. And then when you started getting on to um, talking about, you know, meat grown in factories and taking pills, I sort of lost the plot because I felt <laughs> that wasn't talking really... about taking pills. Well, honestly. That, that it's the sense that it didn't feel natural to me anymore. It didn't <laughs> feel like you if you confused eating... it with some 1930s sci-fi epic. Well, it felt like that very much when you wrote it. And I think when you talk about it, we're not going to be able to eat the lynx. We're not going to want to eat the beavers. What, what are you expecting people to eat? Are they just going to sure. be eating crops? But then also we will have then grown the crops on land. So that's not all going to be woodland, is it? No. So, well, for, for, uh, I mean, if you were to do what I broadly do, which is to eat a, a largely plant-based diet, you would immediately greatly reduce your land footprint, your um, greenhouse gas footprint, uh, your water footprint, just about everything which is involved in, in, in producing our, our, our food you reduce those footprints. But, and, and that's you know, just where we are using plants as our substitutes. 
Now, plants aren't great substitutes for animal products, you know, and, and if you're not going to eat substitute animal products, and I'm not remotely interested in veggie sausages or, or veggie burgers, I don't, I don't really like them, I don't think they're very good, you know, I prefer just to eat um, nice plant-based meals, there's lots of brilliant Indian meals and Thai meals and loads of wonderful things you can make entirely with plants which aren't pretending to be animal products but i realize that i'm in the minority here you know most people are going to want to eat something very much like animal products now for 12,000 years we've been farming multi multicellular organisms plants and animals and we pretty well push them to the absolute limits of their efficiency i mean i think you can say with a chicken you have pushed it beyond the limits they can't even support their own weight anymore many of the chickens that, that people eat. But we've scarcely begun to explore the farming of unicellular organisms. And I think this is going to be a massive shift in human diet um, and indeed in human civilization itself. It's going to be the most important um, environmental technology ever developed. Because if we do switch to, to farming microbes, instead of farming multicellular oh, organisms, oh, oh, exactly. Patrick, George. we can greatly, I uh, beg your pardon? So I'm farming microbes. Yeah, well, no, no, you, 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 you introduced the microbes of our into, into your cheese. That's, well, of course, of course, that's right. But but that's a highly yeah. inefficient way of doing my, it. Whereas if we're, if we, if not we're farming, let me, let me just, just finish what I'm saying, and then you can come on to your lovely cows. But you know, so so you know, uh, growing microbes. I mean, uh, uh, you know, on uh, for instance, if you use um, hydrogen or methanol as, as your feedstock, you can reduce the land area by thousands of times you can reduce your water use massively your fertilizer use massively according to my calculations you yeah, can produce all the world's protein fertilizer. half a sec all the world's protein in an area the size of greater london not that i'm suggesting that that, that, that we grow it there but that, that would enable a massive rewilding and those and and by producing uh, unicellular organisms you can produce far better substitutes for animal products than you can with plants. But also I think it'll trigger a whole new cuisine because just as the first people to domesticate a wild cow weren't thinking about camembert, there's a huge range of potential products that we can start making from microbes. Now I know this all sounds very sci-fi, but it's not about pills. I mean, I the first I was the first person outside the lab to eat a pancake made entirely from bacteria. It was delicious, it tasted just like a pancake. It's, but, but, but we've got to start thinking big. And at the moment, we're in a situation with livestock where we're saying to people, oh, just stop eating it, but we're not giving you any good substitutes. It's a bit like saying stop burning fossil fuels, but we don't have solar panels or, or windmills. So what are you going to do? Just just get cold. So so it, we now have the potential. And I think we should stop feeling afraid of it. We should stop being so neophobic. We should grasp the enormous scope for greatly reducing the environmental impacts of our diets. So Ewan has put here, without well, livestock, you how do we return nutrients and organic matter to soils that are used to growing grain? So how, as Patrick would say, how, how are you going to restore those soils that have been growing grains? Yeah, well, there's, there's a huge amount of, um, amount of mythology uh, around this. You know, and people say, well, we're mimicking nature. This is the way you do it. You know, when you look at mixed farming yields, they are really small by comparison to other forms of grain growing or vegetable and fruit but growing. And so that, that leads to considerable agricultural sprawl. It means you have to use more land to produce a given amount of food. George, and then when you look George, at the use of manure George, as a fertilizer, you find you're losing 37% more nitrogen than you do with artificial fertilizers, which is why the Soil Association rules allow you to import manure from conventional farms using Harbour Bosch nitrogen but at one step removed. George, I, on this farm, we are practicing farming in harmony with nature, and the results are fantastic for carbon, for nature, for people, and for good, delicious food. Come and see and walk around the farm with me, because honestly, this is 50 years of practice. Our yields are going up there. They're not tiny yields. We're growing crops in a rotation, and to the point that Alice made, if you were going to rebuild the devitalized and decarbonized soils 
after 60 or 70 years of continuous arable farming, you need a crop rotation. And typically, 50% of that rotation will be fertility building of clover and grass. And in order to turn that bit of the rotation into food that we can eat, then you need ruminant animals. And I am certain from my own observation here that the system works and builds fertility of soil. And the methane emission of the rumens, which have been part of an ancient carbon cycle, can be more than offset by the soil carbon gain. I'm really confident about this. I've never felt more positive about our relationship with nature, which, of which we are part and the animals are part. And even in your wild ecosystems, you're going to have deer, you're going to have, and we're the top predator. And unless you have males and many lynxes, and you know, you're going to have to control some of these animals. And I agree with you about sheep. Of course, there are too many sheep on the mountains. There's so much inspiration that can be found from a growing number of farmers all over the world, but including in the UK, who are adopting these regenerative systems. I agree with you, there's no uh, formal definition, but I'm talking about a serious definition as we use in our Feeding Britain report to define the practices. I really think you should reassess your view about the, uh, the efficiency in ecological terms of the farming systems that I've been using for 50 years. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, when, when you look written. at the numbers, so, yeah. sorry Alice, I'll, I'll yep. just come back briefly on this. You know, when, when you look at the numbers, you find that in order to produce something which is in any way ecologically regenerative, in other words, for instance, at the Net Wildlands estate in Sussex, very famous project, which a lot of people say, you know, this reconciles um, um, the return of wildlife with food production. And it is a great example of what you call non-trophic rewilding, rewilding without predators. You know, so it's missing some components, but there's a lot coming back and it's brilliant. But they produce 54 kilos of meat per hectare per year. And if you were to turn the whole of Britain into net, you would, we would each have 75 um, calories of meat per day and nothing else. It's tiny, not, tiny productivity. We in order to reach we in Britain. Patrick, We've just done the a moment. <laughs> It, well, uh, no, well, actually, I have read that report, and it's so full of holes, it, it makes a colander look, look watertight. But anyway, well, please, um, please the, can we can uh, we trade uh, yeah. with a public exchange of emails yeah. starting mm -hmm. now? Your critique of feeding Britain because we yeah, put no, a I'd, lot. I'd, of I'd be happy to do yeah. that. But, but so I think but, I'm going to move on now <laughs> because otherwise we're just going to be trading facts and figures <laughs> and disagreeing with each other. So uh, Joe has actually put a very good question, which is: Isn't the vegan versus omnivore omnivore argument a distraction from the bigger causes of environmental damage, from transport and energy and plastic? You know, actually, if you take someone like Patrick's farm, what he's doing could actually be beneficial. Um, and it could be neutral. You feel it's that, that actually it may be mildly detrimental, but it's nothing like flying or the plastic waste or um, really just human consumption of goods that goes on outside food production. Well, actually, um, livestock production produces more greenhouse gas emissions than all transport. Um, the, 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 there's a recent paper showing um, it's, uh, I mean, it's, there's a range, we, we can't be completely sure, but the lower part, the, the lower point of the range is still higher than, 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 that wouldn't than, be than under global Patrick's transport emissions. It's a sustainable version when you have, you're, you've got... It might be, um, it depends. I mean, if you were to roll that out, um, because of the methane and nitrous oxide produced by, by his cattle, um, and... You know, he you know he makes these claims about soil carbon. Well, we'll see. But but because of those very powerful greenhouse gases, um, uh, it, it could even be under Patrick's system that that would continue. We need. But if to we were eating your, if we were eating all your pancakes, George, wouldn't that would also be detrimental, wouldn't it? Because we'd be having farming and factories, and mm. we would also it would probably be done to scale, and you would also get these you know vast yeah. conglomerates. So, well, well, it. And yeah, it may yeah. not actually be particularly nutritious for people to eat either. Well, you've mixed up about six different issues in one question there, so it makes it rather hard, hard to answer. But yeah, it, if you're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, much, much lower from precision fermentation than, 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 than from any of the farming systems we're talking about. Um, yes, there's a real danger of corporate concentration, as there is in all aspects of the food system and indeed all aspects of the commercial system. And so... As, uh, as everywhere, antitrust laws should be strong and intellectual property rights should be weak, and that requires political campaigning. But at the moment, 90% of the global grain trade is in the hands of four corporations. 
Do we ban the global grain trade? Well, if we did, billions would starve. No, we've got to break up those corporations. And we need to do that in the new food economy, just as we need to do that in the old food economy. And you think you could do that? Well, I mean, look, it's within the human capacity to create political change, but it doesn't happen passively. We have to get together. We have to campaign. We have to mobilize to create the food system, as well as all other aspects of the economic system that we want to see. But that only comes about effectively through political action. It's not going to come about through consumerism alone. And we've become really passive when it comes to political action. You know, we allow the big corporations to walk all over us. And that's that's a change. It didn't used to be like that. Antitrust laws used to be strong. Intellectual property rights used to be weak. But it's been reversed by the effectiveness of corporate lobbying and the ineffectiveness of citizens campaigning. But just say we took Patrick's view, um, and Nick Sinfield's asked this, um, how long would it take to rapidly translate that to a level of success across the countryside? What kind of measures would you need? Because at the same time, as the, I mean, both of them, they're both are actually not at extremes, but they're, they're both very different views. It, it really depends on how they're rolled out, both of them, doesn't it? So it does depend on big business. It does depend on that. How, how could yours be rolled out, Patrick, to make it work? I do think it would need uh, large companies. I think it will need uh, large retailers. I think it's a top down and bottom up transition. And it will need a bit like, as I mentioned, the energy transition. Um, that started with the, the, the then German Minister of Agriculture, Renata Kunast, introducing the feed in tariffs, which essentially taxed the fossil fuel companies uh, to enable uh, small scale renewable energy generation to be profitable. And look where we've got to now. It's more profitable to produce using renewable energy than it is uh, using fossil fuels. We need to get to that situation quite rapidly with, ag with the agriculture, land based agriculture. And I think we can. We need to finance the agricultural transition. We need to create conditions where it's more profitable to farm the way we do than it is to farm in an extractive way. That means the application of the polluter pays principle. It needs banks, insurance companies, food companies and retailers, yes, and also governments to enter into a new collaborative a scheme whereby we, I would say it, take, it would take about a third increase in farmers' income uh, to, from where sustainable farmers are at the moment to make all farmers think, okay, I'll go on this transition journey. And society as a whole has to put that together. And of course, the criticism which is on the Today programme this morning is uh, food prices will go up. Well, I, I'm sure you'll agree with this, George. We currently have dishonest food prices because the polluter isn't paying. We've got hidden costs of food which are going into climate change, damaging public health, polluting rivers. Yes, the why is an absolute disgrace. And all those mega dairy farms should be banned immediately. So government can play a role. And as we saw during the uh, recent Ukraine conflict, when energy prices went up, the Chancellor stepped in and he gave us all uh, money to make sure that we didn't get into energy poverty. We need to do the same with food if that becomes necessary. So it's a great coalition of different people, including small farmers and then right up to the big food companies operating together in an unprecedented way, because basically we've got no choice unless we get our foods and farming systems uh, in harmony with nature, not causing climate change, not threatening the sixth extinction, we will not have a habitable planet. The, the thing is, um, you know, all, all that is great, but if we were to reduce meat eating to the point at which it was in any way compatible with the habitable planet, you know, which means a tiny, tiny proportion of the amount of animal products that we eat today, it really would be the case that only the rich would eat it because it would it's become like, a very honestly, that's not true, commodity. George. No, well, well, how could it not be true? I mean, that, it would I'm old enough to, I think you I think I'm a bit older than you, but <laughs> I'm old enough to remember during the 50s and 60s when I was a boy, we had chicken once a month. It was a very expensive treat. We celebrated it. And that was right, because ecologically, a ton of grain is very expensive to produce. We didn't have industrial plant production then. And so the staple meat was grass fed and mainly grass fed beef and lamb. We need to go forward to that situation again. And it will be 
it will be its true price. We shouldn't yeah. fool ourselves. And, and the true price can would be, ensure that really you know, only the world's richer people could eat it. Now, you look back to your childhood and say, well, you know, we, we weren't that rich. You prob- By comparison to the global average, you were probably extremely well, rich. You know, you, you were a landowner, you were, you were farmers. You know, how, how, how would you not be um, rich by comparison, by comparison so, so to most I'm going to give another question people. to you here, which feeds into this, which is from an anonymous attendee. But it says, eating well as a vegan is actually a challenge for time poor people. How can we vegans avoid unhealthy, ultra processed, expensive food, which contains additives, preservatives and high levels mm. of salt and sugar while maintaining a nutritious and wholesome food based diet? This is absolutely true. Um, and, and I don't deny that at all, because at the moment, um, the products are really poor. Either you need to have enough time and the cooking skills and the kitchen and the pots and pans to produce your own food, um, in which case you can make really great vegan meals or you're going to be paying a lot of money for not very good products. And that needs massively to improve. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so enthusiastic about this unicellular one cell revolution, um, because it can produce much more cheaply with much less processing, much less um, need to sort of strip out all the plant secondary metabolites in order to make something more like an animal product. Um, and, and you can, you know, I mean, that, that, that pancake I ate, came straight out of the vat, the flower. Just, it was just this golden colored flower coming straight out of the vat, 100% bacteria. We had to mix it with a bit of wheat flour to bring down the protein and, and fat content. Otherwise, we would have made an omelet instead. Um, it didn't require any processing. You know, but plant-based products require a lot of processing because they're so dissimilar to animal-based products. And they, the protein content is much lower. Um, they they they're tangled up with all these plant secondary compounds, which are defensive compounds. There's loads of unicellular organisms which don't have any of that. So, and and ultimately, this is going to be decided on price. You know, we, we these debates are great. We can use moral suasion. That's not what's going to sway most people. It's going to be, are we can we produce a really healthy, cheaper product with a far lower environmental impact, which people are going to want to eat. And at the moment. It has to be said, most plant-based products have failed to do that. But what about the lab based products can, can can do much better? We're not so talking about lab. What? We're not talking about lab meat here. We're not talking about cultured meat. That's the dead end. Precision we're protein, about precision protein. fermentation. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I'm doing okay. precision fermentation in the ruminants of my cows and making cheese, and mm-hmm. it's working. And it's producing, it's building soil carbon and it's coexisting with an abundance of biodiversity. What's at wrong a massive, with that? At a massive land cost. And so it's, 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 it's this it's, huge it's, issue, which is always George, a problem. I mean, you, talk, land, saying, you asked me a question. You asked me a question. Let me answer it. Um, you know, you, you were talking about the polluter pays principle, which I'm very much in favour of. You're quite right. It's absolutely essential. But, you know, it, included in that has got to be this crucial environmental metric how much land are you using and what are the opportunity costs of that land use? What ecosystems would that land be supporting? How much carbon would those ecosystems be absorbing if you weren't using it in this very extensive agricultural sprawling way, using a we're lot of land to produce not, not very much sprawling. food? And, and if we were to incorporate those costs, your system wouldn't come out nearly as well as you like to imagine it would. So, George, can I just ask you one other issue, um, which is who would be looking after your land if you rewilded it and, you know, across Britain? Who would own it now? Would it be owned by large landowners, which at the moment is the people who are wilding tend to be the people with the money? Mm. Yeah, so there's there's two models. There's two sort of major models of rewilding at the moment. One is I I call it aristocratic rewilding, which I'm I'm not so keen on. The other is community rewilding, like the Langham Moor Trust, which have bought their own land. The communities bought it or um, Trees for Life, which has bought land through public subscription. Um, I mean, it's you know, it, it doesn't necessarily change the land holding model. And in fact, you can we're in a great position to create a, a just transition here because there would be no extensive livestock production at all in this country if it weren't for public subsidies. You know, we're, we're paying the money which keeps those animals on the land and prevents wild ecosystems from, 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 from being restored. It's completely perverse. But we could pay the same money um, to farmers to say, do the opposite. You know, and let you know we'll pay you to bring back the wild ecosystems, to rewiggle the rivers, to do all the things which which draw down carbon on a vast scale, and have a much richer ecosystem defending our bigger life support systems, which keep everything going. 
But I suggest with Patrick, you probably feel that you are feeding the country, that that's part of your purpose. It's, it's looking after the land, but also feeling that you're giving something to the country, isn't it? That's what farmers do feel. Yes, I, I feel that I think the farm, a healthy farm is an ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem. We have one here. It's not unique, but I feel so sure, deeply sure that if George, if you came and had a look around this farm today, you would be blown away, away by the beauty of it, by the fact that we are working the land in harmony with nature. We're producing a surprising amount of food, 30 or 40 tonnes of cheese a year, lots of milk and meat, as I mentioned earlier. And we are doing this. It's not a brawling operation it's it's actually quite efficient but at the same time there's this amazing atmosphere of nature which permeates just about every corner of the farm and I just think I don't want I don't want to trade stats with you George I care about science but I'd like you to come here and I think we should we should film ourselves going round and have a positive conversation because I think that for as long as you and I argue about these things we're not going to move forward to where we both agree we need to be which is humanity living in harmony with the natural world and i believe we can do it based on the principles we've used here for for five decades well uh, thank you patrick i mean uh, next time i'm in your part of the world i'd love to come i'm always visiting farms um i i'm always learning from them um, i love doing so but we also have to see the bigger picture we have to look at the numbers because what you have to see is what you're not seeing in any one place that's what we mean when we talk about ecological opportunity cost it's like you know we're seeing what is here and it can appeal to the eye very much so because it chimes with those farmyard storybooks it chimes with the pastoral poetry it chimes with the old testament and with the new testament with all that thousands of years of imagery but what we're not seeing which very often are the things which have been demonized by our culture, the wolf, the lynx, the deep dark forest, all those things also to an ecologist, to the eye of an ecologist, have a tremendous beauty of their own. And so we can trade aesthetics, but that actually doesn't take us very far. We also have to be aware of what the science is saying and of what the numbers are saying. And you okay, now, George, I think we're going to have to wrap up there. And I think okay. we're going to ask people to vote again and see whether anyone has changed their mind. So if you could all vote now, you have a couple of minutes. And while you are voting, so we can see uh, what the um, answer is. And it says host and panellists cannot vote. Um, I'll ask you just a couple of final questions, really, just summing up. Um, George, do you think this is going to happen in your lifetime at all? Or is it actually... Uh, just a pipe dream and, and and do you feel when you look at it do you think Britain would look more beautiful in the traditional sense mm. or would it look completely different under your system <laughs> so um more beautiful than what I mean we're facing you know we are facing a sixth great extinction you know we, we, we're facing the collapse of earth systems and it's very hard to imagine what that looks like um you can see it in the rocks when it's happened before you know and you're talking about you know just ecosystems disappearing, soil disappearing, global circulation systems stopping, the planet simply becoming uninhabitable. And that will include Britain if we don't make very, very drastic and rapid changes. So, you know, I'm deeply fearful for the future if things do remain the same, if we do follow these sort of trajectories of, well, let's just carry on a bit as we are and tweak it a little bit and and have a bit more livestock and a bit more of this. We have to make huge drastic changes, just as we do in energy, just as we do in every aspect of the economy, or we're not going to get through this century. Now, my lifetime won't extend very much further into this century. I've I turned 60 recently, you know, um, but, you know, even now we're beginning to see drastic impacts and a lot of those, far more than we know, are being driven by our diet. And that is primarily driven by our, our eating of animals. Patrick, how would you sum up just to, to try and convince people to have farms like yours? Well, there's so much I agree with about what George just said. And I came here 50 years ago as a back to the lander from London. It was a hippie commune. And after 50 years, I'm deeply convinced that the system of food production that we've developed here could be applied nationally, that's our Feeding Britain report, but also uh, as appropriate to every country in the world. And I think that there is a growing awareness amongst especially young people 
that this change is possible, that it is needed, and that I'm convinced it's going to happen. So I, I don't feel pessimistic. And the main reason I don't feel pessimistic is from my own practical experience here on this farm. I think there's huge cause for optimism. And I just want to embrace George. I don't want to fight him. I just don't think we need this sort of combative exchanges. I, 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 I don't really feel I've even done justice, if I'm absolutely honest, during this uh, exchange. I just know some deep place inside myself that this change can happen. And if we if we collaborate and talk to each other in a new spirit, I think we can make it happen quite quickly. Thank you both very much. And we have got now the final vote, which is 31% now agree and 53% disagree. So um, I would say that uh, it's the undecideds that have really changed. So you have swung a few people, George, as has Patrick. I think we only have 16% undecided. So both of you have been fantastically persuasive. And you both, I think your views are so much better than what we have now. But I think either option uh, to me is just so measurably uh, more impressive than anything we're seeing or we're seeing out of DEFRA. So thank you both very much. Um, and I do hope that George, you go to the farm and look at Patrick's farm and I hope uh, Patrick comes and eats one of your um, pancakes at some stage. Uh, <laughs> I'll and give it a go. And Alice, you're very right much. too. Thanks, oh, Alice. Also, Thank you, yes. Patrick. Thank you all very much. Great Don't chat. go to Greg's and get a vegan sausage roll is my only thing there. <laughs> God, good luck with that. All right. Thank you all very much. And thank you very much for joining. And thank you so much for all the questions, which were fascinating. Um, and for the voting, uh, which shows that more people are gradually being persuaded to go vegan.